Okay, well, good evening or good morning, everyone. We'll get started. Welcome to today's event. I'm your host. My name is Emily Thompson. I'm the training director here at Cellavision. Um, I'm just going to cover a few things before we uh, get started, a, a little bit of housekeeping. We're going to ask you to turn your camera off, although we're a smaller group this time, so if you really want to turn it on, you can. We are going to ask that you keep your microphones muted uh, for now. I'm going to show you a way that, um, that you can ask questions uh, in a Q&A function in a second. So we'll ask if you have any questions um, that you do it using that functionality. And just a notification that we are recording this session and we'll make these recording uh, available to everyone afterward for anyone who wasn't able to attend. Or if you have a question, you want to review something that you might have heard today. So you'll get that in a follow-up email. So thanks again for joining us. Our presenter today is Dr. Stephen Marino. Um, Dr. Marino is the Medical and Scientific Affairs Advisor at Cellavision uh, and is also uh, an adjunct assistant professor at Rutgers University here in the United States. I think that most of you uh, probably read his bio when you registered for the webinar, so I won't read it all again, um, but, but there it is. Um, so he's going to go through today some of the results of the global test that you all took. Hopefully you're all able to uh, do it and complete it. And hopefully you reviewed your results before coming today. But even if you didn't, I think you'll find what he has to say interesting and hopefully you will learn something in today's session. So um, without further ado, uh, Dr. Marino. Well, well, thank you, Emily. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you, and I just want to first apologize for the glare in my glasses. I haven't figured out how to get rid of the glare. If you know a solution, please type it in for us. Um, so uh, yeah, let me share my screen. So the objectives for today's webinar is to summarize the results of the participants, to review cells uh, that had significant disagreement uh, between the uh, participant and the expert, which is me, and then the participant against the majority of the responders. Discuss background information about malaria as well as the clinical and laboratory findings and outline possible clinical explanations for some of the abnormal findings that were in our patient. So I may give the pre presentation notes quickly. Um, recommendations or guidelines that I may state during this presentation come from the International Council for Standardization and Hematology or the ICSH, unless I state otherwise. Uh, we will provide you with this publication. Just a quick note, the procedures used in the proficiency case may be different from those in your lab. You should always follow your laboratory's policies and procedures for differentials uh, when performed on patient samples. So a quick summary uh, overall of the differential results. The overall agreement um, for uh, white blood cell and red blood cell evaluation uh, was good. And that's between the participants and me and the participants and the group majority. So here you see a comparison against from the users or the participants with with the examiner, that would be me, and the white blood cell agreement uh, was an average of 83%, and red blood cell agreement 85%. Um, there were quite a bit of a range there uh, between the, the lowest and the highest uh, agreement. And then in comparison with the group majority, it was quite similar. Um, the average WBC agreement uh, was 85% with a big range, and then the average RBC agreement uh, was also 85%. Uh, 
Major areas of disagreement um, in the case were in the classification of the extracellular parasites, the gametocytes, uh, the classification of large granular lymphocytes, which were increased in this patient, and then the classification of white blood cells. A few of them had morphologic features of both lymphocyte and monocyte. So there were a few cells that we'll look at that were actually difficult to determine whether they were one or the other. I had problems with them. So we'll, uh, I'm, I'm happy to discuss my issues. Um, so here's an overall a, a, a view, a zoomed out view of the um, red blood cell morphology screen. And you clearly note uh, the gametocytes uh, that are present here, as well as the numerous target cells. Um, also, there is sort of a slight to moderate polychromasia that, that's evident, a slight anisocytosis, and uh, occasional Hal Jolly body and rare Pappenheimer uh, bodies. Most of you graded the polychromasia as one to two plus, target cells two to three plus, um, parasites is one to three plus, and anisocytosis one to two plus. I also graded similarly. Um, I happen to grade the target cells as three plus, and I base this on the ICSH criteria, um, which is in the article by Palmer that you'll get, uh, which shows that um, target cells more than 20% uh, is a, a grading of three plus. And to do this, I visually estimated the percentage of target cells. Now, Cellavision has something called the Advanced RBC software. Uh, it's available and it actually determines the percentage of each type of abnormal RBC morphology or the poikilocytes that are present. Um, and it bases this examination determination of the percentage on thousands of total red blood cells. So had I had that, I wouldn't have had to count the individual um, red blood cells. So let's look at uh, the potential or possible explanation for all of the target cells uh, that were that were found. Um, target cells are associated with the hemoglobinopathies, uh, the thalassemias, iron deficiency anemias, patients who've had splenectomy, uh, patients with chronic liver disease, as well as they can be an artifact. Now, the MCD was normal. Uh, in the patients. So it was above 90 femtoliters. So that ruled to me, ruled out thalassemia, iron deficiency, hemoglobin E uh, disease R trait as I thought about hemoglobin C, but sometimes in hemoglobin C, uh, the patient can have a, a normocytic um, indices. So um, I ruled these out. Target cells, uh, when present in liver disease, um, are usually larger. They're sort of macrocytic. And in my experience, the concentration of target cells in patients with liver disease is lower than what we're finding here. So because of the numerous target cells, and there were several folded cells, as you can see in these images, folded cells are... Uh, seen in very few conditions except the hemoglobinopathies. So I concluded that it's probable the patient had an underlying hemoglobinopathy. But there were no sickle cells that I could find, no hemoglobin C crystals, no Washington Monument crystals, or other more specific indicative features of exactly what type of hemoglobinopathy the patient may have had. That's about all we can do is just to say, suspect hemoglobinopathy, not on the report, but between us in this proficiency test. In order to determine exactly what type might be present, if it's, you know, S, C, E, uh, you know, various hemoglobinopathies, further testing would be needed. Um, that's usually done with hemoglobin electrophoresis or high-performance liquid chromatography. 
or another test uh, to uh, examine the different hemoglobins um, that are present. So then let's look at other laboratory results that were abnormal. Patient had a low hemoglobin, so it was anemic, uh, increased reticulocytes and polychromasia, NRVCs, the patient had an elevated bilirubin, and LDH. And all of these combined are sort of indicators of the presence of a hemolytic anemia. And that makes sense uh, as part of the anemia uh, etiology and malaria. Um, also, possibly the, the patient had this, you know, hemolytic anemia due to the hemoglobinopathy might be contributing to that uh, in part. Patient had a mild thrombocytosis. Um, there's no, I couldn't find any association uh, with malaria. I mean, a, a thrombocytosis is uncommon in malaria. Malaria is usually associated with thrombocytopenia. Um, there were held jolly bodies, as you see here, and I found rare cells with these Pappenheimer um, bodies. And so when you see that sort of thing, you suspect a hypofunctioning spleen or the absence of a spleen. So in terms of the results and how the participants performed, uh, one thing that uh, stood out is the differences in the way these extracellular parasites uh, uh, were handled, uh, these uh, malarial gametocytes. Most participants uh, put these cells in the unclassed category. Uh, the second most common result was others. And then the least uh, but used um, way to classify was putting them in artifacts. I, by mistake, put them in artifacts, although using the unclass and artifact category were acceptable because if you put cells in these categories, they are not included in the cell division differential. That's important. If you used other, other is really not the best choice on cell division because the others, the cells are the, the objects that you put in others are included in that white blood cell differential. And so they will affect the accuracy of the cell counts. It's important regardless to follow your lab's procedure um, when any type of parasite is found uh, using manual microscope or cell division. Now, I wanted to mention uh, an option uh, for labs uh, that are in areas of the world where malaria is quite prevalent. The possibility is to create what we call a user-defined cell class, uh, which any, anyone, any lab can do. Um, when this is created, uh, you would, you know, select non-WBC type of user-defined cell clots and give it a name such as, um, I said, extracellular parasite or some similar name to where when you encounter these pre-classified um, parasites that you can actually move them into a category with the name uh, for that uh, particular thing. Okay, so now it's time for a little break and I wanted to ask you a question. Can you raise your hand if large granular lymphocytes are counted as a separate cell class in your lab? Please raise your hand. Thanks. Okay, so yeah, so there's one one person who's raised their hand. Anyone else you see at the very top of your screen, you have the option to uh, raise hand. Nope, so just one, Steve. Mm -hmm. Sorry. It's interesting, I, I wanted, we wanted to ask that question is because there were a significant number of participants that actually classified uh, LGLs in the category called LGL, which is perfectly fine. 
Um, but I, 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 many labs put them in the normal lymphocyte category, and I'll, I'll talk about that in just a moment. So our patient, uh, this, these are the lymphocytes present um, in the patient. So our, our uh, case, um, there were a, a significant number of large granular lymphocytes, and they're circled in red boxes. We'll describe them in just a moment, but yet yeah, you can see here that that it, it stood out to me as being an increase. But what is an increase? Um, well, let's first say that, as I mentioned before, most participants classified LGLs as lymphocytes. Uh, second most common was LGL, uh, but some classified these cells as monocytes, or some of them as monocytes. So you want to sort of go over that uh, that issue. Uh, briefly, um, large granular lymphocyte morphology. This is a larger normal lymph that has increased amount of pale, clear blue cytoplasm, bluish or light blue cytoplasm. Yet there are distinct pink purple granules present and Often or sometimes they are found in one part of the cytoplasm. Not always, as you see in this patient. Um, in addition, uh, large granular lymphs have a sort of similar uh, nuclear chromatin pattern as uh, mature lymphocytes. Uh, it's sort of got that smudged, uh, condensed look. Uh, here are some of the large granular lymphocytes uh, in our patient. As I mentioned, large granular lymphocytes are normal. They're actually normal lymphocytes, um, and cell division preclassifies them with normal lymphocytes. Large granular lymphocytes in healthy individuals can represent up to 20% of the total lymphocyte population. Now, that's not 20% of the diff, so uh, this has to be interpreted carefully. Our patient had 13 LGLs out of 28 total. So to determine the percentage, it would be to divide 13 by 28, uh, multiply times 100, and that equals 46%. So indeed, the LGLs were increased. Uh, the ICS guidelines suggest um, adding a differential comment when the LGLs are increased, which is more than 20% of the uh, total lymphocytes. And the reason for that is it can be an indication to the clinician uh, they may want to order flow cytometry because there may be an underlying LGL neoplasm, such as LGL leukemia. Um, and that needs to be ruled out um, versus a reactive increase in LGLs. I looked, but I, I could not find an association between an increased number of LGLs and malaria. Now, let's talk about differentiating large granular lymphocytes from monocytes. Uh, so here I show you, I kind of blew them up a little bit, but uh, these are, you know, uh, relatively clear uh, monocyte, LGL, monocyte, LGL. So how do they sort of differentiate between them? Well, monocytes, cytoplasm, as you see here, is an evenly stained, dull, gray or gray-blue coloration. So you see here that the color is very dull and it's bluish gray. Uh, many uh, monocytes, they have nearly indistinct or sometimes invisible fine granulation distributed throughout the cytoplasm that can make it appear sort of like ground glass in the uh, cytoplasm. Now, the chromatin in monocytes is very important because it's, it's very different than a lymphocyte, or it should be different. It's less condensed, and in monocytes, the 
chromatin pattern, you actually see the chromatin strands, if it's a very good monocyte, you see the strands, they're sort of fine and delicate and lacy, and they sort of appear like linear strands. Now, these are monocytes, and I can imagine I see the chromatin strands in here in a linear fashion. I don't know if you can see that too, uh, but this is a classic uh, uh, chromatin pattern of a monocyte. LGLs, on the other hand, the cytoplasm is a, a pale blue. It's clear. It's not dull like this is dull. And of course, as I mentioned, you've got clearly visible granules. I mean, monocytes, you can sometimes see the granules as well. But here, you should always see clearly visible granules. And like I said, sometimes they're in one part of the cytoplasm. Chromatin in an LGL is more condensed. Then in a monocyte, it doesn't have that lacy look. It's got like a smudge condensed pattern. And the nucleus of an LGL is typically uh, round or oval or sort of indented a little bit. Uh, the problem is in this patient, the lymphocytes, many of the lymphocytes had an irregular nuclear contour. So it complicated uh, their classification. Excuse me just a second. <clears throat> and it's been about um, the few uh, cells that were present um, where it was a little difficult to differentiate between, you know, are they monocytes or are they lymphocytes? And here are four of them here. There were others, but here are four um, I wanted to point out. So there was a disagreement. Um, like I said, and but the cells had characteristics of both. So it's quite understandable uh, why they might be uh, misclassified or, you know, questionable. Morphology was confusing. Several lymphocytes, like I mentioned, have unusual shaped nuclei. There were LGLs present um, that had vacuoles, as you see here in this LGL, which sort of makes you lean toward is, is it a monocyte? And many of the LGLs had more granulation than that's typically seen. Um, I don't know if that's your experience, but it's mine. Uh, they had uh, quite a bit of granulation, and the granulation was not as, you know, distinct. Like in other words, they were not as large. The granules. Now, also combined with that to be confusing is that some monocytes were small, like this one, you know, which which appears almost like a lymphocyte. And then there were also the large lymphocytes, the LGLs, that made it appear as though they were monocytes. Now, here are four difficult cells. And actually, 50% of you said that this was a lymphocyte, and 50% of you classified this as a monocyte. Personally, I put it in the lymphocyte category, but now I've changed my mind because I've looked at it quite a bit. I, the cytoplasm is dull gray here. It's very dull gray. And the granules, you know, they're sort of in the background. They're not clearly uh, visible. And if I look carefully, the chromatin pattern appears more like a monocyte. It's got the lacy look. Uh, so I, I think it's now, I, I would go for monocyte, but I, I totally understand if you say that this is a lymphocyte for sure. Most users, as well as, as I did, they call the cell a monocyte. It's got the dull coloration, uh, uh, faint, almost invisible granules, and a very lacy monocyte chromatin pattern. However, it was small. Uh, most users call this cell as a, a lymphocyte or an LGL, which either was completely fine. Um, but however, there was a significant number that called this cell a monocyte. And I'm thinking it was because of the vacuoles, maybe the granules. Um, yeah, so that, that was an issue. And then most users uh, call this cell a monocyte, but there were a good number of, of people that, that said this was a lymphocyte. I put this in the lymphocyte category and sent my results in, and then I immediately changed my mind, but I couldn't change my results. So you may see that I put this as a lymphocyte, but I do believe it's clearly a monocyte. Um, 
it's got the you know the the the, the lacy chromatin pattern are sort of lacy the vacuoles the granules are not distinct and the the color of the cytoplasm is really dull it's not the bright light blue color here so that yeah and if you want to know how i classified all the cells just log into your proficiency account and you can go to the white blood cell tab and and you can see that now we're going to talk about malaria a bit and i wanted to ask a question please raise your hand if in your laboratory you see malaria more than six times a year No, so that's nobody in this group. Yeah, so I guess everybody in this group, it's pretty infrequent. Yeah, I, I understand I mean, that. Yep. You know, mm -hmm. totally. Yeah, where I, where I worked was infrequent. Uh, yeah, so thank you. The basic facts, in case it's been a while since you've looked at it, the word malaria comes from Italian words meaning mal air or malaria, which is air, um, which means bad air. In 2021, there were 247 uh, million cases of malaria globally um, and 619,000 deaths. 95% of the world malaria cases occur in Africa. And in Africa, 80% of the malaria deaths are in children. The plasmodium organism causes malaria. It's transmitted to humans by the Anopheles mosquito. And there are five uh, species of plasmodium infecting humans. There's pla uh, vivax, excuse me, uh, falciparum, vivax, malariae, ovale, and nalisi. Uh, briefly, the life cycle of plasmodium in the human, because this helps explain why we see different uh, malarial forms in uh, the blood smear. So the first, the uh, Anopheles mosquito uh, transmits sporozoites to the liver in the human. And in the liver, the sporozoites um, infect liver cells and they actually form schizonts, which is uh, a liver cell that's full of these uh, sporozoites. Eventually, the uh, these uh, sporozoites are released into uh, circulation and they're called merozoites at that point. And that's when uh, there's the erythrocyte stage and these all infect individual uh, red blood cells. They invade them and then that starts the cycle in the blood. So interesting, this is a, uh, a coloration or colored um, electron micrograph uh, image of a red blood cell, a schizont, that is full of these uh, merozoites. It's kind of yucky. Um, but yeah, that's it's all full of these, and each one of these is infective. You know, it can affect uh, other red blood cells. So eventually, um, the merozoites uh, mature and they form trophozoites, which is like the ring form. Um, and also then multinucleated schizonts, which means schizonts with these, you know, all of these merozoites. Now, I can go in two paths. Uh, these schizonts, which are the red cells full of the merozoites, can rupture and infect all these, uh, can infect other red blood cells, or some of them go on to mature into the gametocyte, which we see on the blood smear. And this is what's taken up by the mosquito when it does another feeding in a human and transmits, or at least it continues the cycle of, of plasmodium in the insect. Now, if we look at the different species, uh, the morphological characteristics of these different uh, forms, ring form trophozoite, the schizont, and the gametocyte, uh, they can be different. They can be similar, but they can also be different between species. And that can be quite helpful um, in identifying the, the species of plasmodium present on the blood smear. Um, 
Yeah. So some are similar, but but yeah, with experience, I think uh, people that have become experts uh, in this can can use that to differentiate between these species. We don't have time to go through all of this today, but I wanted to mention that to you. The clinical findings in malaria, um, anemia is the most frequent complication in malaria, and there are several causes for this anemia. The clinical manifestations of anemia, you know, they include the typical signs of lethargy, fatigue, pallor, etc. And then there is fever, and fever is very important uh, in malaria and diagnosing malaria. We'll mention that in a moment. Uh, patients can also have a combination of headache, cough, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, and other symptoms. And this is all associated with what's called uncomplicated malaria. <clears throat> and malaria should be suspected in patients who present with a fever, as ours did, and who have a history of visiting a region uh, where malaria is endemic. Splenomegaly is common in malaria. Um, our patient had splenomegaly. Uh, however, patients with splenomegaly are typically thrombocytopenic because the spleen, when it enlarges, it typically holds on to platelets. It becomes a reservoir that enlarges. Um, in our patient, the platelet count was slightly elevated, so the cause is unknown. Patients with malaria can also have hepatomegaly, as in our patient. And we also saw uh, something like elevated transaminases or liver enzymes, myocoagulopathy, increased BU and creatinine. Some of this seen in our patient, also common in malaria. Malaria can go on to develop into severe malaria, especially in plasmodium falciparum. And one of the definitions of this, there are several, is that patients should have at least 5% parasitemia. And in addition to that, there can be a wide range of serious clinical manifestations, deadly. Interesting in, in, in malaria is that patients go through this uh, fever paroxysm. And this is where uh, there are intervals of, in falciparum it could be, um, Irregular or 48 hours at a time, um, patients can go through a hot stage where they have fever, uh, which lasts for hours, and then there are episodes of profuse sweating, that stage, and then that's followed by chills. So it's this cycle um, that's seen in malaria, uh, which is helpful um, for diagnosis, and it's also a symptom, of course. But this regular cycling of fever um, as I mentioned, in falciparum, it's every 48 hours, or, or it can be intermittent at different times. Um, it's been associated with the simultaneous coordinated rupture of all of the RBC schizons. Remember, schizons contain all of the merozoites. So, but it, also these red blood cell schizons, there are a lot of cytokines within. All of that is released into circulation, and it's believed that that uh, is the cause of this fever that cycles. So a bit about plasmodium falciparum, which is what we suspect in our patient, and I'll talk about that. Uh, it's the most dangerous form of malaria. Uh, it's got the highest rates of complications and death. The level of parasitemia in falciparum is generally higher than in other species, and that's calculated by the number of infected red blood cells divided by the total red blood cells. It can sometimes exceed 50% of total red cells. And the higher it is, uh, the risk is higher for uh, developing severe anemia, systemic disease, and even death. So the crescent-shaped gametocyte that we saw in our patient, or, or you know, there are several of them, is quite distinctive for falciparum. And it's key in identifying the species. So the gametocyte is, is, is very important. Other features of falciparum is that there can, there are often numerous ring forms present within the red blood cell. Here, this is our patient, and there are how many? Four here? Four uh, ring forms within this RVC. The rings can be smaller than in other species. And interesting is that uh, you don't generally see the schizont in circulation. 
Uh, I have a picture of one in a moment, but this is this is unusual in falciparum. Falciparum can infect red blood cells at any age. So, you know, there's a 120 day lifespan. It's any time or any age of the red blood cell from one day old to 120 days old. Um, falciparum has, uh, you know, it can it can infect all of them. Plasmonium ovale and vivax. They generally inv invade only young red blood cells or the reticulocytes or the polychromatophilic cells, the larger ones. Uh, malaria infects red blood cells at the end of their lifespan, so the old, what we call senescent red cells. And malaria will develop over time into an organized life cy cycle within a, a human to where nearly all the parasites present will go through the same stage of development. And remember, that is when the release of schizonts and all the merozoites. So yeah, uh, it, it, especially in falciparum, there eventually is a coordination of the cycle within the patient. Um, the anemia in falciparum uh, is typically normocytic, normochromic, as we're seeing in our patient. Um, however, these these uh, uh, patients generally have a decreased uh, reticulocyte count, and so our patient does not have that. So it makes you kind of believe, well, maybe the reticulocytosis is due to something uh, else, perhaps the hemoglobinopathy or something else. Some images. Uh, this is from the ASH image bank. It shows uh, plasmodium falciparum, the ring forms, as in our patient. And here is the unusual presence of the schizon, where you can see the individual merozoites present. And then also, uh, here are a couple of images of gametocytes. Um, they look quite similar to the ones in our patient. Here's a different patient um, from the case patient, um, but I'm showing you this because it's a nice image, but also because uh, the falciparum here is at higher concentration. So the level of parasitemia appears to be increased, uh, which as we mentioned is, is very significant in terms of um, the clinical outcome. <clears throat> Excuse me. Lastly, I wanted to just talk about the hemoglobinopathy patients or people with, uh, you know, heterozygous or homozygous hemoglobinopathies. There is a protection there against malaria. There's a large body of evidence showing that patients with various hemoglobinopathies, as well as thalassemia, have different levels of protection against uh, malaria. Uh, sickle cell trait studies have shown it has a great degree of protection. C disease and C trait, also as C disease, E trait, and hemoglobin E disease. All of those hemoglobinopathies, there has been evidence shown of uh, protection uh, against uh, malaria. And then also in the quantitative hemoglobinopathies or the thalassemias, both alpha and beta, um, there is a, a protective uh, conferred in, uh, to the malaria. Now, what does protection mean? Well, first of all, the, the protective effect is uh, multifactorial. So there are multiple mechanisms, um, some of which are not well understood at this point. But there's clear evidence showing protection against severe complicated disease. So severe malaria, as well as <clears throat> patients with hemoglobinopathy have tend to have decreased hospital admissions than patients without hemoglobinopathies. <clears throat> Sorry. This is something I was interested in. The evidence is weak though. Um, are patients with hemoglobinopathy actually protected against becoming infected with malaria? Um, that evidence is not strong at all. So the evidence there is that you're protected against you know, severe disease, uh, clinical disease, et cetera, but not so much against becoming infected. And lastly, I just want to mention that uh, platelet clumps uh, were seen and commented on by some of the participants. 
However, for the sake of time, uh, I'm going to hold this conversation um, to a later date, maybe a, a subsequent uh, test case where we have more time. Um, but yes, there were definitely platelet clumps in these patients, and some of you did comment on their presence and that there might be a potential for inaccurate platelet counts. <clears throat> so in summary, this is the first global test of 2023, and it was a symptomatic patient with plasmodium falciparum malaria and possible underlying hemoglobinopathy. Uh, the proficiency test results showed differences and how participants, so you guys, how you performed are uh, classified extracellular parasites and large granular lymphocytes versus the um, examiner, which is me, and then also against the majority of the participants. A few cells were challenging, as we saw, uh, in terms of differentiating between lymphocytes and mo monocytes. We discussed those differences along with the comparison of common cytologic features of large granule lymphocytes and monocytes. We also had a general review of malaria, a quick review, um, and we looked at some of the expected clinical and lab test results and reviewed these findings in our patient and looked for potential causes for the abnormal results. And lastly, I, I hope you found this webinar presentation interesting and also useful uh, to you. And with that, I, I thank you very, very much for your attention. Emily? Okay, thanks very okay. much, Steve. Um, we, we did have one question that someone um, wrote in, but since we're a small group, does anybody, would anyone like to turn their microphone on and ask a question? Thank you so much for your presentation. That was really amazing and very oh, comprehensive. Hey, yeah. um, I do have a couple of questions. Um, in relation to morphology commenting, um, do you take that into account at all in as part of your marking system? Um, say if I commented on toxic granulation on the on the neutrophils or that malarial, you know, trophozoites were present, um, do you actually take that? in any form or is it more about putting the cells into their groups and putting the red cell classification into their groups? Emily, you want to come in on that? Sure, yeah. <clears throat> on the, the global test and in prof prof proficiency software, e even if you were a customer who uses television proficiency software in general in your laboratory, the comments um, aren't really taken into account for the for the calculations, yeah. you know, when you're getting percent agreement or disagreement, they're not taken into account, but there is the ability for the examiner to enter comments that a participant can then see at the end. So a participant mm -hmm. can see if they put in a similar comment to that of the examiner. And the examiner can in fact see comments yeah, that participants yeah so steve was able to see your comments but right. yeah they're not factored into those numbers the software mm -hmm. doesn't do that in a lab setting that's a little easier but we had you know a couple hundred people take it so yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it doesn't automatically take them into account but an examiner can see them and they can also enter comments that that you can then see at the end with your results should they choose to I read you. your comments, Suzanne. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Steve read all um, the comments. All, <laughs> they were good. Of course he did. They were really good. <laughs> I like them. Thank you. Um, yeah, look, I couldn't split some of those cells. It wasn't uh, allowing me to do that, to count them separately. Is that mm -hmm. just because it was a global test? Um, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, they, yes, we should have split those beforehand for That's you. All good. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to know, how did you get to the degree of um, parasitemia or density in the malarial, um, the, the parasites in your red cell characterization? Because I think you classified them as one plus. Um, oh, um, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I you know, uh, it was just a qualitative thing. I didn't right, look right. at guidelines for that. Um, <laughs> You know, and where I worked in the past in the laboratory, we just reported positive or negative or present or not, you know, um, and I, I couldn't, really, you know, guidelines to say exactly how I should do it. Um, and I didn't have the, yeah, it was, it, that's, it was hard. I, I probably should have put more, but I just put one plus. 
That's all good. I just wanted to know whether you, you know, followed the um, WHO one for counting no. in thin films, which I think will be quite difficult because you do just have that monolayer, not the whole film, um, to count yeah. the um, amount of parasites, I suppose. Well, like they had, they, they, I think they recommend 10,000, right? 10,000 red blood cells screening. Um, we, oh, I'll have to go back and check. I, I, I did a qualitative really one a, too. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. And I believe that we're, you know, we're, we're looking at that. But in the advanced RBC software, you know, we count like 2,000, 3,000, maybe four uh, at most. So we're not, it wouldn't be applicable for screening. However, for monitoring patients that already have a diagnosis, it's perfectly acceptable for that, as well as assisting in species identification. Yeah. Um, but, Thank you yeah. so much for, oh, sure. for that. I was uh, um, quite eager to talk to you. <laughs> yeah. Good, good. And and actually, I'll just share because someone also had, had written in. Um, you showed a picture, Steve, of um, ring forms from this patient. But someone had written in, were there ring forms in this patient? So I don't know if someone wanted to see them again or forgot or maybe didn't finish the test and is here anyway. But so these are actually the results of my test. You can actually see this is my account with my name above. So you can see my results. I disagreed with Steve on the target cells. Um, but true. over on the right hand <laughs> side here, yeah. You can see this is the the red cell view from this patient. So, um, to answer that person's question, yes, there were ring forms here. Um, can you see my pointer? Okay. Yes, you can. Yeah. So some here, some here, and you know, Steve showed the the cell that actually had four in it. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not sure where it is, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and as Steve pointed out, there's another one there. Um, the advanced RBC software will actually give you a percentage of red cells that we find that are infected, and, and you can uh, make adjustments if we've missed any. But then if you have put in the guidelines that you want to use for grading parasitemia, it will automatically convert that to one, oh, two, yeah. or three plus. So, but yes, so to answer that person's questions, there are some ring forms uh, in here as well. They weren't Just particularly sorry, high last, in oh, concentration. Um, that's why I showed that additional patient that had quite a few, but, you know, they're, they're, they're present as Emily's showing you. It's, uh, you know, it's, they're there, but not as many as you would expect in falciparum, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, you had one more question? Yes, sorry. Um, yeah, in relation okay. to the how jolly bodies, I also saw occasional and I didn't know whether I didn't think in our lab, if you see the presence of how jolly bodies, you have to report on it. Um, and I thought, well, if it's occasional, I needed it to be there for you guys to see that I saw it. And the only way I could do that was put a one, whereas you guys decided not to put um, you put zero for the um, how jollies, even though you mentioned, Stephen, that there was, um, you know, occasional. Is there any other way of, I suppose, showing the presence of it? Um, well, I have to admit, you know, to you, in that yeah, occasional this was, my, this was aspect. my first time to take to do it. It was my first time, so I've overlooked some things. Um, <laughs> How jolly bodies was something that I, you know, I should have reported, you know, a low number of them, but I should have reported they are significant, but I. I overlooked it. I have to say that I, that's, that's what happened. Good. <laughs> but it, but again, it would really depend on your grading policy in your lab. So there were yeah. so few that there probably are some lab policies where that would still be a zero. Um, but yeah, in this case, probably grading it as one probably would have been a good idea so that we know that you, we know they're you, there. Yeah. Yeah. You know that yeah, we know yeah. they're there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. but yes, they were definitely there. I, I, I was quite excited mm -hmm. to do this, so no, I'm God, waiting I'm for some too. more. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, yeah. great. Great. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, yes, Stephen and Emily, thank you for this session. It was very useful. Um, mm -hmm. I have never used television, but 
our hospital has purchased the cell vision it is sitting in the box but uh, Steve you showed um, you, you mentioned folded cells um, I was a bit confused um, are these stomatocytes are you talking about stomatocytes no um, folded cells um, I know they're present in in hemoglobin C disease, you see them, uh, oh, and right. other. It's, it's where the red cell actually. Can you see my hands? They kind of it folds over, so it's not the same as a stomatocyte. Uh, you know, it's actually folded like almost in half. You know, like you're folding a piece of paper. Yeah, yeah. That's what I think they they are doing, and it look kind of looks like yeah. So they're you know they're they're not found in many in many conditions uh, except unless you guys know of one, except for hemoglobinopathy. Thank you. Sure. Thanks for the question. It was good. Yeah. So just to finish up, please stay tuned for our next global test later this year. I think uh, in the summertime or just before the summertime, if you have agreed to be contacted by us, you will get a link to the recording of this webinar. Uh, also, in case you have any questions, you want to watch it again, share it with your friends. Uh, you will also get a link uh, with an invitation to the next global test. If you've not agreed to be contacted by us, you know, please keep, please check in on our website, uh, on LinkedIn, with your school, with your lab, wherever you get your continuing education information from. Maybe it's the Hematology Interest Group on Facebook. Um, we're really looking forward to continuing this series, and we hope that you will continue to join us for it. With the webinar recording, you will have an opportunity. We'll have a link in there for you to be able to download uh, that Palmer article with the ICSH guidelines that Steve mentioned a number of times. So, so thank you all very much for your time. Uh, we hope that you learned something new and please continue to join us for the global test in the future. Yeah, thank all you right. everyone. Yes, thank you very thank much. You so much. Bye-bye.